Welcome to the first episode of the video lecture series for the upcoming book, Money Chasing Behavior. This is the author, Zach Ox, and in this short lecture, we're going to be covering the introduction along with a preview of the other chapters. Money Chasing Behavior introduces an entirely new type of economic theory, one that contends that we've made a critical error in logic when it comes to how we interact and create wealth. This mistake leads us to throw away vast amounts of potential wealth and well-being that we could have under different conditions. To put this logical error into context, we need to have the right frame of mind going into the discussion. So if we think this is a minor critique that would change GDP or some other measure by only 10%, this is grossly underestimating the scope of the problem. In the current discourse, the distinction between existing systems and superior alternatives is framed as game A versus game B. The term game refers to game theory and how individuals interact. Game A refers to the status quo win-lose system, and game B refers to possible win-win scenarios. If you enjoy paradigm shifts and find this lecture intriguing, on the slide are some of the popular Game B commentators, researchers, podcast hosts, and writers in the sphere that you might want to look up. To put this Game A, Game B distinction into context, let's start with a cooperative dynamic. On screen is Game Theory Matrix of an example called the Stag Hunt. While this example will be covered in further detail in the book and likely in a later lecture, the premise is this. Each individual or player has the option to either hunt a rabbit or a stag. If the two players both hunt for the stag in a cooperative fashion, their success rate goes up drastically, and their payoff will be much greater than had they acted alone. This payoff is win-win, and the point of using this example is to illustrate the real conditions in which we exist. This cooperative dynamic should make sense, as we're far better off working together than we would be on our own. It's all about how we interact. Despite existing in a cooperative dynamic, this is not at all how our current interaction systems function. To understand how our present systems work, we need to first understand the real nature of money. Money, or currency, is our primary interaction tool. Money is just a tool, one that signifies social value for exchange with one another. Whether it's gold, crypto, fiat paper, or digital, these all serve as tools for social interaction. Now, at any given moment, the amount of money in circulation, or the money supply, is a fixed amount. This means that in order for you to gain a dollar, someone else must lose a dollar. While this is oversimplified for goods, which can be produced and consumed, the key takeaway is that there is a finite amount of money that changes hands over and over. We are effectively just passing these money tools around. So to contrast the two dynamics, on the left we have the real option to work cooperatively for a real payoff, and on the right we have options limited by our interaction tool or currency. Instead of making win-win decisions, our default interactions are win-lose, and this creates inefficiencies that make us worse off. Despite having the cooperative interactions and optimal outcomes as possibilities, this problem occurs because our social constructs like money limit and direct our decisions within a narrower range of options. For an applied example, let's compare two types of possible labor. We're going to stick with two players or individuals for simplicity, but just note that in reality, these interactions include far more people and decision options. So in this example, we have two options of how to spend our labor. One, we can build wells to provide clean drinking water. And two, we can be telemarketers and sell people things that they don't really need. In the green cooperative quadrant, we have tangible production that provides substantial utility or benefit to well-being. In the red quadrant, we have little to no real production with individuals simply convincing each other to purchase low utility goods. So for this entire matrix, these payoff values represent real benefits, things that we really create and their payoffs. And we're going to set those in the background because unfortunately, this reality is not what our decision making focuses on. On top of our real decision options, we have an extra layer of social decisions that capture our attention and decision making processes. Here, we predominantly focus on monetary payoffs or how much money we can acquire in exchange for our labor. 
This is because money determines what we can purchase, and the things that we can purchase are the payoffs that affect our well-being. Digging wells in sub-Saharan Africa isn't going to pay as well as selling overpriced junk, so we gravitate towards options that pay better. The problem, of course, is that good pay does not equate to a wise use of labor. When the real products of our labor are what provide us benefit, we inadvertently devolve to low benefit labor because of monetary payoffs. We'll cover this in more detail in chapter four when dealing with why the entire supply demand equilibrium and efficient market hypothesis are broken. But these poor outcomes are the result of money chasing behavior. This is favoring the control of money over creating the real wealth that money purchases. To properly grasp the magnitude of this effect, let's look at the following thought experiment. We exist in the present, and apart from things like natural disasters that'll be outside of our control, what our world will look like one year into the future will depend on the decisions that we make between now and then. Every economic decision between now and then is represented by a decision matrix. Think about what an average day is for you and how many economic-related decisions you make. Whether it's setting an alarm for work, turning on lights, running water, accessing the internet, or what you eat and which medicines you take, there are an incredible number of economic-related decisions that we barely notice. Take some time to pause the video and think about what that number is for you. Now consider how this looks for a global economy of nearly 8 billion humans. We're talking about tens of trillions of economic decisions every year minimum. And we're not going to fit a few trillion matrices on the screen, so here's our abstraction. This depiction with the arrows and the blue dot represents a single decision tree of trillions of decisions. And this is a special decision tree that leads to what we can call the best possible future. This optimal outcome depends on optimal decision making all along the way. Naturally, with a near infinite number of decision combinations, there are a near infinite number of possible futures that we could exist in one year from now. Take these trillions of decisions and apply the poor decision making structures of money chasing behavior and our win lose currency dynamics, and we get far less optimal decision trees and outcomes. This all comes down to our collective decisions made over the course of the year, and the systems that influence those decisions. The purpose of the book is to show how we ended up in these conditions, and what we need to fix to follow a better decision tree. When we understand how simple this fix is, we could find ourselves in a very different future very quickly. In the next lecture, we'll cover the core concepts from both chapters 1 and 2, there, we'll address the fundamentals of wealth creation and how this logical error first arose in the barter system, and then how it spread. We're going to quickly cover the remaining chapters and some of the most interesting topics within each, but feel free to pause the video to read the full descriptions. Chapter 3 picks up with the real versus social differences we've just covered in the introduction. We'll get into how we should logically ground our currency and why a coherent currency is going to require an expiration date. Chapter 4 goes further into the effects of money chasing behavior and how our current supply and demand models are broken and keep us poor. Chapter 5 covers the purpose of taxes and introduces the road pavers dilemma, which is an example showing how many people logically cannot afford their own labor. Chapter 6 deals with the distinction between real or objective wealth and wealth as a social distribution. Chapter 7 uses the fundamentals covered in the previous chapters to show how calculations for the theory function and why the most valuable data in the world is unavailable. Part 2 in the book builds on the foundations established in Part 1 and transitions to policy logic, or what policies are logically required given the societal goal of maximizing well-being. Chapter 8 covers policy requirements around resources, labor, and some of the currency basics. Chapter 9 covers production efficiencies, the role of public production and its relationship to taxes. 
and how a proper currency functions differently from our contemporary win-lose currencies as covered in this video. Chapter 10 brings in the private sector and how the tax structure allows capitalism to profit extensively from improving well-being. Chapter 11 addresses automation and why in an optimized system losing your job should be considered a good thing. Additionally, we'll return to changes in production efficiency and how we should want our currency to deflate over time. Chapter 12 addresses investments with a currency that expires and the risk-reward profiles of major investment types. The third and final part continues increasing the topic complexity in a question-and-answer format. We'll cover some of the other hidden malfunctions regarding market bubbles, functions of non-laboring populations, predictions for a possible standard of living, and much more. During the manuscript phase, I've intentionally left room to answer some of your questions in the book. As we get further along in the lectures and articles, I'll add a post on Twitter to note when we are starting to take submissions. If you'd like to support this work, please like and subscribe on YouTube for new videos, follow on Twitter for content updates, and share the related lectures and articles widely. Free content will continue to be released between now and the book's release in December, and social media support and sharing are greatly appreciated. For those capable of contributing monetarily to the campaign, the campaign is now live, and we do need to reach some pre-launch goals before the book goes to print. Following the campaign link will allow you to pre-order the book and receive some additional perks like voting on the book's cover, receiving an author-signed edition, access to early content releases, and much more. These donation amounts are obviously in excess of what the book costs and should be thought of as support plus extra perks. These are for those who can afford to contribute early and get the campaign across the finish line. In these trying times, if you can't afford to assist early, please do not feel compelled to donate. Sharing the lectures is free, and spreading the word is an easy way to help. All forms of support are greatly appreciated. Thanks for watching.